special event. Um, Angela Carter and her husband founded a folk club in Bristol. And today, for the first time in 50 years, some of the people who sang and played with them then are here to play and sing for us. This concert was arranged with Chris Molan, and I'd like to thank her, I'd like to thank our musicians, I'd like to thank our singers, and I'd like to thank you for coming along to celebrate Angela Carter in folk song for the 25th anniversary of her death. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Um, this is quite a historic moment, really. Um, I don't have to take you back to the Lansdowne pub in Clifton, which in the post-war years was a Masonic room, panelled, with a bus horn on the wall, uh, smokers' bow chairs and ashtrays, and uh, <coughs> smokers' bow chairs and ashtrays. It was just uh, rather strange, but it was perfect for ballad singing, and Angela spotted it. So in 1964, they decided to hike up from the pub the session they'd had down in Hotwells and take it into a quieter venue where Angela could then begin practicing her beloved ballads. Uh, she wanted a, a friendly audience, so we had to sing around. And myself and Tom here were the kids. We just sort of went along every fortnight and sang with them. But more of Tom later. Uh, um, so now we've got this splendid... Um, ensemble, and I'm going to introduce um, Rosie Upton, who's going to sing Fanny Blair. Now, Fanny Blair is the song which you'll find written out in Angela's own hand in that gallery in, over there. It's when Paul died, very sadly, in 2012. He left his archive, and some of his things, um, her writings and notes and bits and pieces, were in that archive. Thanks to Paul for treasuring those pieces of work um, because this is history and I'm going to hand over to Rosie who's going to sing it. Thank you. Come all you young fellows wherever you may be I pray you give attention and hearken unto me for it's by me I need the female I am a wounded full soon and it's now I'm to be cut down in the height of my bloom. It was last Sunday morning as I lay on my bed. My young friend, he came to me and this to me he said, Oh, rise up, Henry Higgins, and fly away from here. For they're bound out against you on the word of Fanny Blair. Oh, Fanny Blair, she's a child scarce eleven years old. And if I'm to hang for her, the truth it will be told. For I never had dealings with her in my time. And it's now I'm to die for another man's crime. On the day of the trial, Squire Vernon, he was there. And it's up on that great table, he lifted Fanny Blair. And the lies that she swore to, why no man can tell. But Squire Vernon, he stood beside her, he said, you told your story well. Now when the people, they found out that young Higgins was to die, why they rose up in anger and gave a loud cry. Oh, we'll catch her, we'll crop her, she's a lying little whore. Young Higgins, he dies innocent, of that we are sure. Now there's one last request that I have of my friends That's to carry me to more fields at night by themselves And to bury my body 
It's about a dastardly man, <laughs> and it's a warning to young maidens not to talk to any men you might meet while you are out walking around the fields, which I'm sure none of us would ever do anyway. <laughs> One evening as I rambled among the spring. And her hair was black, and her eyes were
And she says, young man, be civil. My company forsake, for it's in my good opinion. I fear you are awake. And he said, my dear,
with me at Paul and Angela's session, and um, Tom's actually playing the same concertina. <laughs> anyway. The first time since then as well. Um, yeah, um, talk about Angela, I think. Yes. There was a house we all had in common, and it was the past. That's a line from Angela's last book, uh, Wise Children, which was published in 1991, just before she died. Uh, and for a small group of us, that house was actually a ground floor flat in uh, Royal York Crescent, home of Paul and Angela Carter. Um, I first met them in 1964, I was running the folks on club in Cardiff and a couple of us used to come over to Bristol most weekends uh, because Paul and Angela uh, were running the uh, club at the Lansdowne here in, uh, in Clifton. Um, and that was, that was really the sort of, you know, the central thing uh, in our lives then. Um, very it's cluttered. curious. It was. Sorry? Very cluttered. It was. Very cluttered, yeah. <laughs> You remember the dresser, didn't you? I got... It, it's funny, when Chris asked me for, you know, recollections of that time, yes, I've got a lot of... Uh, well, I say I've got memories, um, fond ones, treasured ones. Surprisingly few. It's 50 years ago. And, uh, you know, you kind of expect that living or at least staying fairly regularly with um, people like Paul and particularly Angela. You know, life might have been incredibly exciting with lots of literary things happening and so on. No, it wasn't like that at all. But I, at the time, I don't think any of us had the faintest idea that Angela was actually writing a book. Um, I did because I used to sleep in her study. So I think I read Shadow Dance before anybody else did. Um, but that was 1964. Um, we used to go down into Bristol, sometimes on a Saturday night, uh, to the old Duke, folks on club there, and heckle Fred Wedlock, and stand at the back and sing and shout, sing as a folks on Fred, um, which we don't think he ever did, but, <laughs> but there you go. Um, and I remember one night, we were coming back, we were walking back up through um, Hot Wells, and, uh, and Paul, Angela's biographers have done a great disservice to Paul. They describe him as being dour. Well, he never was. He was extremely funny, um, a bit shy. Um, he had a pure old sense of humour, as did we all back then. Um, but we were coming back up through Hot Wells one night, and uh, somewhere Paul had bought a box of fireworks. And we let one off in the street, and this woman came to the door, uh, came out of the door, and started waving her arms about, remonstrating, saying, "You can't do that here." And uh, I went, I walked over and just sort of had a quiet word with her, and came back, and I said to Paul, "Let off another firework." <laughs> so he did. He let off a nice Roman candle, you see, and this woman stood there and watched it and. At the end of it, she said, oh, thank you very much, and went in and shut the door. And Angela came over to me and she said, uh, what did you say to that woman? And I said, uh, I told her that I was a professional pyrotechnician and we were doing door-to-door -door firework displays. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and would she like us to let one off for her? And, and Angela just turned to me and said, you're fucking insane, you are. <laughs> Um, but that sort of thing, you know, that, that sort of thing. Made me laugh. I'll tell you about the mangle in a minute. But we used to um, we used to sit down in the kitchen at the back of the flat the night, you know, with a bottle of wine. And one of Paul's favourite tricks, and, and this is one thing that Anthony didn't like. They had a very nice white cat. Um, and Paul used to take this cat, and along one wall, they had this huge wooden dresser all built in, covers at the bottom, row of drawers, and all these open shelves. And he'd take this cap and he'd stick it in a drawer and shut the drawer, I think. And, and we'd all sit there. And, 
And sooner or later, this cat would emerge somewhere. We never ever knew where it was going to come out. Um, so this was kind of a bit of fun because, you know, we always do sort of take bets on where the cat would, uh, would emerge. But Angela never thought it was, never thought that was very funny. <coughs> what she did think was funny was jokes about used contraceptives. I have no idea why, but one of her favourite ones was um, about the bloke who used one as a bookmark. <laughs> and the story came to a sticky end. <laughs> and if you, think, if you think that's in bad taste, well, I'm just telling you how it was. Um, the guy that used to come over from Cardiff with me, Bill, uh, he was a gas fitter. So he had an appreciation of plumbing which went way beyond anything that the rest of us you know, might consider normal. And uh, Roy York Crescent, of course, was Georgian. So the plumbing was a um, much later addition. And, and as those you know, early plumbing was... Uh, were. They were very much over-engineered. Pipes were huge and all the rest of it. And, and they were all copper. And Bill <laughs> said to her one day, he said, uh, you know, these pipes would look lovely polished up. And she turned around to him and she said, if you think I'm going to spend the rest of my effing life polishing effing pipes, she says, you can think again. <laughs> she went ballistic. And she didn't she went ballistic. spend the rest of her life <laughs> polishing pipes. She spent it slightly more useful than that. As, uh, as I'm sure you all know. Um, but she was a bit, she could be a bit naive as well at times. And we, uh, we, we went on this trip once um, with um, a chap called Bill Leader and his wife. Bill was a recording engineer from Topic Records, uh, as was Paul. Paul did a lot of recording for Topic Records and Collector and so on back in those days. <coughs> uh, we went on this trip up to Shropshire and Radnorshire, we went up to record a traditional singer called Fred Jordan. And uh, we stayed in an old coaching inn in Prestine, in what used to be Radnorshire. I'm not sure if it's today, I can't keep up with all these things. Um, but there were five of us. And we went in and asked for a room for the night. And, uh, and this, this woman, she was, you know, only too pleased to oblige. But when we were shown to our rooms, certainly from my point of view, it was quite obvious that were, we were the first people who had stayed there for God knows how many years because she had to take the dust sheets off the furniture and, uh, and put fresh bedding on the beds. Um, but it was a lovely place. And, uh, and the following morning, the breakfast was absolutely magnificent. Eggs and bacon and you know, all, the, all the trimmings and everything. And out in the yard at the back of this uh, inn, Angela had spotted something that she set her heart on. It was a mangle. It was huge. I mean, we were, there was five of us in an old 1950s Humber, and God knows how on earth she thought we were going to get this thing back to Bristol. Um, but it was massive. It was sort of half a ton of domestic cast iron with huge wooden rollers and all the rest of it. And she said to the uh, landlady, um, I'm very interested in the mangle out of the bank. She said, uh, is there any chance that, uh, that, that I could buy it? And I all sort of sat there and I, what's all this? And, and this woman said, oh, oh dear, um, hmm, just a minute. And she went all red and she dashed off, you see. Anyway, a couple of minutes later, her husband came out and he said, um, I'm sorry about the mangle. He said, um, my wife, wife's a bit embarrassed about it, really. He said, because actually she still uses it for the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and how on earth Angela thought we were going to get this massive piece of kit back to Bristol, heaven, heaven only knows. So, in some ways, you know, she was sort of a bit naive. Um, but we were just on the verge of leaving the pub, and uh, the landlord comes rushing out with this gun. And he was obviously very eager to oblige, and he said, "You can have this." He said, uh, you know, "I've got this." He said, "You, you can have this." If uh, everybody, was like, everybody was sort of looking, you know, what on earth is this about? And uh, it was an old uh, army issue, the Enfield muzzle loading musket from about 90, from about 1860. And I said, um, "I said, I love it." 
That was very nice. So I was really the only one who came away from that trip with any sort of trophy. And that sits over my fireplace to this day. And, uh, and for me, that's a very fond reminder of the fun and the times that we had with Paul and Angela back in the 60s. Thank you. Again. It's difficult to follow the maths, especially as this is another murder ballad. Uh, it's one of uh, Angela's list. So this is The Banks of Red Roses. As with so many uh, ballads, we don't know why the lover killed the young girl and she has no voice, which is really very sad to say why he did it. Possibly because she was pregnant, yes, I think that's probably usually the case. Oh, when I was a young girl, I heard my mother say that I was a rambler and too easy led astray. And before that I would work, why I'd rather sport and play with young Johnny on the banks of
wording here and there of uh, a medieval hymn to the Virgin Mary, the Castle of Love and Grace. There may indeed be something in this, uh, I wouldn't diss this completely, but I also can't help the suspicion that it was written by somebody who was severely under the influence of alcohol or, <laughs> or something else. Uh, but it's, it's always been one of my favourite songs, as indeed it clearly was for Angela Carter. Uh, and this particular version comes from not so far from here. It comes from the singing of a man called William Stokes, from Chew Stoke in the Mendips. Uh, Cecil Sharp heard it from him and noted it down in, I think, 1907. And if you don't know what these are, the instruments that I'm playing, uh, this is uh, an Appalachian dulcimer, otherwise known as a mountain dulcimer. Very, very simple kind of fretted zither that uh, developed out of zithers that the European, mainly German settlers, took over to America, and then they developed in their own way in America, once the English-speaking settlers got to see them. Uh, but no such instrument ever seems to have been played traditionally in the British Isles. The streams of lovely Nancy divide in three parts. Where young men and maidens will meet the sweet hearts. It was drinking good. And the noise in the valley makes the rocks fall to me. On yonder high castle, a castle does stand. Tis builded of ivory on yonder
transvestite songs. So um, here are two that she actually sang, and she really, really enjoyed. Well, it's of a pretty female, as you may understand. Her mind being sent on travelling into some foreign land. She's dressed herself in men's attire, or so it does appear. And she's hired with a sea captain to serve him for a year. Now the captain's wife, she being on board, she seemed in great joy to think her husband should employ such a handsome cabin boy. And now and then she'd wink at him, and she'd have liked a toy, but twas the captain found the secret of the handsome cabin boy. <laughs> Now her cheeks were red and rosy, and her hair lay in a curl. The sailors used to smile and say, he looks just like a girl. <laughs> but eating Captain's biscuit, their colours did destroy, and the wasted swell of pretty now, the handsome cabin boy. Now it was in the Bay of Biscay our gallant ship did plough. One night among the sailors there was a flurry and a row. It woke them from their slumbers and their sleep it did destroy. And they swore about the groaning of the handsome cabin boy. Now. Doctor, oh doctor, this cabin boy did cry. My time has come, I am undone, and I must surely die. The doctor, he come running and laughing at the fun, for to think a cabin boy should have a daughter or a son. Now the sailors, when they saw the joke, they all did stand and stare. That child belonged to none of them, they solemnly did swear. The captain's wife, she said to him, my dear, I wish you joy, for it's either you or I betray the handsome cabin boy. Then each man took his tot of rum, and he drank success to trade. And likewise to the cabin boy, who was neither man nor maid. Here's hoping wars don't come again, our sailors to destroy. And here's hoping for a lot more like the handsome cabin boy. I really love these cross-dressing songs in particular because I think they speak a lot for modern day feminists trying to work out a girl's place in the world. So this one's called Jackie Monroe. Down into this country there lived a wealthy squire who had an only daughter was charming young and fair to me diddle do way to way oh diddle do way she had sweethearts aplenty, to marriage were inclined. But none but John the soldier could gain this lady's mind to me. Diddled away, away, oh, diddled away, away. And when her father come to know, so angry there he swore, I'll give the gang ten guineas to press young John to the war to me. Diddled away, away, oh, diddled away, away. But she robbed her wicked old father, got money at his command, and went to enlist in the army, dressed up just like a man. To me, diddled away, away, oh, diddled away. Your waist is long and slender, your fingers fine and small, your cheeks too red and rosy for to face the cannonball. To me, diddle away, away, oh, diddle away, away. It's true, my waist is slender, my fingers they are small, but it wouldn't change my countenance. To see ten thousand fall to me, diddle away, away, oh, diddle away, away. Before you join our regiment, your 
your name I wish to know. She smiled all over her face, she did. They call me Jackie Monroe. To me, diddle away, diddle away, diddle away, diddle away. So she sailed all over the ocean, over the deep blue sea, till she got her safely landed in the wars of Germany. To me, diddle away, diddle away, diddle away. Diddle away. Where all upon the battlefield she fought it up and down till among the dead and wounded her darling John she found to me diddle away, diddle away, oh, diddle away, away. They have promoted me, she said, they have promoted me unto a colonel's commission. So married we can be to me, away, the way, the way, the way. But up then spoke the general, such things there cannot be. It's against the laws of our country to men to married be to me, the way, the way, the way. Oh, the way, the way. And up then spoke the chaplain. Such things are not allowed. She drew her broadsword from her side. I'll make this do for you. To me, to me, to me, to me, to me, to me. So now they all are married, as you may plainly know. And John, the wounded soldier, got his little Jackie Monroe. This is a song that's normally called the false bride, and I've never understood why, because she's never done anything false in any of the directions I've had. And because of that, I decided when I wanted to sing it, I put together a version that absorbed her of her responsibility in this affair. The week before Easter, the morn bright and clear, and the sun shone brightly to blow the air. All the snowbirds were singing and changing their notes amongst the wild beasts in forests, and the roses were red, and the leaves they were green, and the bushes and briars they were pleasant to see. I went to the forest for to gather fine flowers, but the forest would yield to me no roses. I once loved the land, I loved her so well, but I never did ask her. I'm now for me wound, I'm now for my foolishness, I'm well for dead. She's going to be wet to another, and I was fit to the wedding. How could I say no, with her bridesmen and bridesmaids, she made a fine show. Yes, and I followed after him with me heart full of woe. Oh, to see my love wed to another. And the old parson who married him, how loud he did cry. Oh, you who forbid it, I'd have you draw nigh. And I thought to myself by the best reason why. 
but I had not the heart to forbid it. And the first time I saw me love was in the church stand. Here's the glove coming off, and there's the ring in his hand. And I thought to myself how I should have been my man. But I never once mentioned half And the next time I saw me love, she was sat down to die. Oh, I sat down beside her, and I poured out the wine. And I drank her the lassie, yes, she'll have been mine. And she's went to another, and the last time I saw me love, she was all dressed in white. It's made me eyes run and water, quite dazzled my sight. I flung down me hat and I bid him good night. The beautiful, full-sighted lovers So dig me a grave, dig it long, wide and deep And we strew it all over with the flowers the sweet And I will lie down and I'll take a long sleep Maybe in time I'll forget her. Yes, and I will lie in there and I'll take me long sleep. Bid you to all false hearted true loves. This one is from Northern Ireland, it's called The Verdant Rays of Screen, and Screen is a townland in County Derry, and uh, any song that's got verdant rays in it is good enough for me. <laughs> but I think Angela would have liked this one because when the girl finds out that he is dishonest with her, she won't have any more to do with him. As I rode out one evening fair, I the verdant rays of screen, I set my back to a thorn tree to view the sun in the west country. A lad I spied my unborn side We a lassie by his knee And he was as dark as the merry brown light And she all way and one to see Oh, wait. 
eyes. Be his eyes either blue or brown. No one will never heed what any young man says. If he's fair to man, he's the one she said. If he's fair to man, he's the one. But I will climb the high, high tree, and I'll rob that wild bird's nest, and home I will bring what I find there to the arms that I love. Concertina and also singing. So Angela Carter's voice and playing is actually going to be part of this concert, which is really exciting. And this is a recording that was made in 1967 in Cheltenham, and we're going to hear this voice from the past, Angela Carter.
she's going to be singing The Flower of Sweet Straban. the tunes that Angela played there are, I think, almost certain to have been learnt from the Chieftain's first LP, 1963. Um, and just to indicate how, in 50 years, things have changed, two of those tunes have now become very standard English cultures. Uh, so it sounds a bit like this.
I'm going to sing a song called The Bonnie Bunch of Roses, which is probably one of the commonest songs in um, English speaking countries of the Napoleon period, right? And the Bonnie Bunch of Roses was in, uh, in Scotland, and probably Wales, but nobody ever mentions Wales, I don't know. <laughs> Um, and there's a little tiny thing to go with this. Lots and lots of versions of this song, obviously. Um, and some of you are old enough to remember the Waltersons. Uh, my friend Norman Waterson said to me, why don't you sing this song? Our oh, Michael says it's too musical for, for us. So there we are. I'm only good enough to sing a musical song. <laughs> but it's all right.
I'll cock the drums to beat my load, and I must haste away. The bugle so little is sound, and no longer can I stay. We are bound up for Portsmouth. It's many a weary mile. Oh, well, dearest, well, don't leave me here to mourn. Don't leave me here to cast the day the time I was born. The parting with me will it's like parting with my life. Oh, Oh, I'll put on me velveteens and go along with you. <clears throat> I volunteer me services and go to Egypt too. Oh, I'll fight beneath the banner love and fortune made smile. And Government has ordered the women there to go. All oh, the government has ordered the king he doth command. And I am bound on oath, my love, to serve in a foreign land. For oh, your waist is rather slender, your complexion it is still fine. Your constitution is too weak to stand a hot campaign. Those sultry sons of Egypt, your precious health would spoil. In those sandy desert places on the banks of the Nile. Oh, curse, curse be the day the tether of wars began. Further taken out of Scotland, oh, many a bonnet. They've taken from us our lifeguards, protectors of our isle, for the bodies to feed the worms on the banks of the It's another great song of a maiden, with all that that implies, who manages to stay a maiden, despite problems. <laughs> <laughs> there was a fair maiden who lived all alone. She lived all alone on the shore alone. And no one could she find far to calm her sweet mind, but to wander alone on the shore, 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 to wander alone on the shore. Oh. There came a brave captain.
captain who sailed a fine ship. And the weather being steady and fair, oh, I shall die, I shall die, this brave captain did cry. If I can't have that maid on the shore, 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 if I can't have that maid on the shore, oh. After many persuasions, they brought her on board. And the captain sat down in a chair, oh. He invited her down to his cabin below. Farewell, sorrow, farewell now, dull care, oh. Farewell, sorrow, farewell now, dull care, oh. I'll sing you a song, this fair maiden did cry. And the captain was weeping for joy, oh. But she sang it so sweetly, so soft, so completely. She sang captain and sailors to sleep, oh. She sang captain and sailors to sleep, oh. Oh, and she robbed them of jewels and she robbed them of wealth. She robbed them of fine, costly fare, oh. And the captain's broadsword she used as an oar. And she rowed herself back to the shore, shore, shore. She rowed herself back to the shore, oh. oh. Well, the men, they were mad, but the men, they were sad. They were deeply sunk down in despair, oh. For to see her go away with her booty so gay, with her rings and her things and her fine fair, oh. Her rings and her things and her fair, Ara, do not be sad or sunk down in despair. For you should have known me before, oh. For I sang you to sleep, and I brought you of wealth. And again, I'm a maid on the shore, shore, shore. Again, I'm a maid on the shore, oh. This song is a bit like an Angela Carter novel in seven verses. Um, it's got lots of amazing imagery and shape shifting. Um, it's called The Bloody Gardener. Uh, that's not the bloody gardener, he's just dug up me roses. Uh, but the bloody gardener in the sense, blooded. Um, and um, it's basically about a jealous mother and um, she uh, persuades her gardener to murder her son's girlfriend. Very nice. But in the end, they change shape and uh, fly off into the distance as doves. Uh, there is a 38 verse broadside version of this. In fact, there are several broadside versions of this. This is the Bert Lloyd version, just seven verses. You'll be pleased to know. So, the bloody gardener. It's of a maiden fair and a shepherd's daughter dear. She was courted by her own true heart's delight. But his mother laid a snare and false letters did prepare. Saying, meet me in the garden, dear, this night. So this young maid arose and into the garden goes. Expecting there to meet her heart's delight, 
She's such that garden round, but no true love there she found. And at length the bloody gardener came in sight. He said, me pretty maid, what brings you here this way? Have you come to rob me of my flower so gay? She said, no thief I am. I'm in love with some young man who promised he'd meet me here this day. Then he took out a knife, cut the single thread of life, and laid her virtuous body in the ground. And with the flowers fine and gay, he did her overlay in a way her body never should be found. Her true love lay asleep on a mossy bank so sweet, a milk white dove came fluttering round his head. And with a battering a ring so sweet, all about this young man's feet. And when he woke, this dove she flew away. This dove she flew away and perched in a myrtle tree. The young man followed, full of grief and pain. And from the tree so tall, unto her grave did fall. Fresh blood from her breast, like crimson rain. This young man in anger rose, and unto his home did go. Crying, Mother dear, you've robbed me of my delight. <coughs> He have robbed me of my joy, my jewel, and my toy, and now with my true love, I'll take flight. William Taylor was a brisk young soldier, full of hope and full of joy. He's gone and left his true love Sally, went in search of another one. Sally's friends fell down before her, filling her heart with grief and woe. She's gone and listed in the army. For a soldier she did go. One day she was exercising, exercising with the rest. A golden beam fell down before her and exposed her lily white breast. The captain called her to his parlour, saying, Brought you here, I come in search of one of your soldiers, one of your soldiers I love dear. If you tell me the name of one of my soldiers, one of my soldiers you love dear, his rightful name is William Taylor, William Taylor is not here. If you're in Sir John William Taylor, William Taylor is not here. He's lately married to an English lady with ten thousand pounds a year. You rise early, you rise early, you rise early at the break of day. It's there you'll find young William Taylor. Walking out with his lady gay. So she rose early, she rose early, 
She rose early at the break of day. In strength she saw young William Taylor walking out with his lady gay. She's cold for a sword and she's cold for a pistol. They were brought at her command and there she shot young William Taylor with the bride at his right hand. He's rolled over, he's rolled over, he's rolled over on every side. Adieu, adieu to my true love Sally, once I thought you'd have been my bride. A song that's variously known as Lucy One, Lizzie One, so a few permutations on it. And it's a song that outlines an incestuous relationship between a brother and a sister, which feels very Carteresque to me. <laughs>
and that may never be.
that a proper by a breath it's so true. My love, she's as fair as the bright morning dew. I have read that old proverb, I am sure so have you. So good friends and companions, I'll bid you adieu. So here's a hand to the company and one to my glass. We will drink and be merry, all of one glass. We will drink and be merry, all we to refrain. For we may or my never all be here again. Our ship lies at anchor, she's ready to dock. May the Lord send her safely without shake or shock. And as we are sailing to the land of the free, I will never forget your great kindness to me. So here's a hand to the company and one to my last. We will drink and be merry all out of one glass. We will drink and be merry all to refrain. For we may for my ever all meet here again. Cheers. Carter's memory and for such a fantastic and special occasion. So thank you again for this wonderful treat that you've given us. It's been a real privilege and let's give them all another round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.